Good morning and welcome to our services here at Bible Baptist Temple. Good to see so many uh, faces and uh, thankful for the warm weather. Aren't you thankful for the warm weather? And uh, grateful that it's heating up and uh, we're getting back to feeling like summertime is coming and uh, coronavirus is going. And so uh, grateful for all that God is doing and His mercy upon us. And uh, it's good to see you, good to see several faces that I haven't seen in a good while. And uh, I'm thankful that you could be here today and that circumstances allow. And for all those who are joining us by way of live stream, uh, we're grateful that you can be with us as well. And uh, we sense uh, that God is going to work in our hearts today. And uh, although you're not here in person, uh, we are thankful uh, and grateful that you could join us. And uh, there's good many folks in the house today and a good many watching online. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings uh, right before we sing. And I hope that you're ready to sing. Uh, it is time to lift our voice. Uh, Jesus told them, if we don't lift our voice, then the rocks will have to cry out. Uh, he is worthy of our praise. So let's uh, pray and then let's sing together. Lord, we're grateful for all that you do in our lives. Lord, how uh, much we uh, are thankful that no matter whether we have to be apart, that Lord, you are with us and you are present. And Lord, I just think of the message this morning, uh, how that you were uh, not physically present. And because of that, Lazarus' sisters mourned at the loss of their brother. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to realize, even though we can't see you, uh, that your presence being in our hearts each and every day, the awareness and knowledge that you are there uh, and that you are all powerful, and Lord, that all things are under control, uh, under your control. We're thankful and grateful for that knowledge. I pray that you bless our service this morning. Encourage us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit working in our hearts. Uh, speak to us from your word, Lord, we ask. Uh, Lord, help us to sing your praises with full heart. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's take our hymn book and turn to page 288. I am resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's highest I will come to thee I am resolved to go to the Savior leaving my sin and strife he is the true one he is the just one he had the words of life I will hasten to him hasten so glad and free Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what He saith, do what He willeth, He is the living way. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Great job on that song. If you have your green piece of paper, we're going to sing Be Thou My Vision. Be thou my vision. Thank you. 
be seated. Well, we have something special planned for uh, next Sunday, and uh, I'm going to call it Short Sleeve Sunday. Short Sleeve Sunday, all right? You say, what is that about? Well, I'd like to have an outdoor service in uh, recognition, first of all, that God is good to us, and uh, before uh, long, uh, we pray that God will continue to work and eradicate the illness, uh, and so we want to be able to just say, God is good, and it's good to be outdoors. How many if you know what I'm talking about, good to be outside. And so we're going to have an outside service, okay? Uh, now, no matter what we announce, uh, I recognize the Bible calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. I don't know if he has power over the uh, weather or not, but the last two times we tried to do something outdoor, uh, we got rain in the forecast. But don't worry, this time it's only 93 degree weather, okay? <laughs> That's no sweat for us here in Georgia. We don't even sweat until it's 100. Uh, but it is going to be warm outside, which is good. That drives the coronavirus away. Uh, but we would want to call it Short Sleeve Sunday because you're going to want to wear something cool. Uh, and if you have a shade structure, we would encourage you to bring your shade structure out. And we're going to have chairs set up out there on the front lawn. Uh, and we're going to have big American flags flying uh, and all of our service branch uh, flags out there recognizing the sacrifice of our uh, servicemen and women uh, as they gave their life for our freedoms coming up on this Memorial Day. And so uh, we're going to have that outside, all right? Now, here's some options that you will have. First option is uh, you can bring an umbrella or a shade structure and sit in uh, chairs, and uh, those will be provided in groups. And so once you get here, uh, you'll drag enough chairs together for your family uh, to sit, your household to sit, okay? Uh, and so people that you've already been interacting with, that's no problem at all. Uh, but make sure that you set them up six feet from someone, some, somebody else who you're not interacting with, uh, and we will continue to comply with this until things go uh, wide open in our state, and we've made a lot of progress. I was even looking at the trending uh, numbers uh, last night, and uh, we are seeing a, a steady decline. Uh, of course, as more testing is available, it's hard to see that uh, full drop-off, but I believe as a state we're doing well. Uh, and praising God for that. Uh, so we'll be spread out, okay? That's option number one. Bring some shade, wear your short sleeves, and sit uh, with your family or household. Second option is we will broadcast it uh, on the radio, okay? Uh, and that is a proximity-based radio system. Uh, so you have to be parked in our parking lot to get it. You can't be sitting in your driveway at home uh, and getting that. We're not broadcasting all over uh, the Warner Robins-Macon area, but it is a local broadcast where you'll be able to sit and tune into it with uh, in your car. So maybe you want to sit there in your car with your air conditioning going, windows up, listening to it and watching it. That's option number two. Option number three, is uh, we will have speakers, of course, for everybody to hear, so you could sit in your car uh, in which there's shade, possibly even run your air conditioning and crack your windows some and listen to the sound uh, coming through the speakers. So those will all be options. Uh, it is going to be a patriotic-themed celebration, uh, just saying thank you to all those who've given us the freedoms that we have, even the freedom to assembly, assemble as we are enjoying now. And, uh, of course, states uh, all over the nation are handling this differently, and those who are saying churches must remain closed, churches are being bold and saying, no, we cannot do it uh, any longer. As long as they can pack them in Walmart uh, as an essential organization, uh, the church is essential as well. And uh, uh, the mental well-being of people, people don't understand the spiritual help that people get in church and the interaction and fellowship they get with fellow believers uh, is more important than medicine. Uh, it's more important in many times uh, than just getting their regular household needs. We need each other uh, and we need God in our lives. And so uh, we're excited about what's going on all over the nation. People are even fighting legal battles and so on with different municipalities, uh, but still standing up for the rights. Where were those rights come from? They came from God uh, who defended them, our uh, brothers and sisters in uniform, and they laid down their lives, many of them, uh, and we celebrate their 
victory, if you will, even in their loss uh, for our freedoms. And that's what Memorial Day is about. So we're going to celebrate that uh, with some patriotic display. Uh, and then Short Sleeve Sunday will be rounded out with you bring your very own picnic lunch, okay? Uh, and so bring it for your family. There's no sharing, okay? Uh, no smorgasbord, uh, no potluck line, okay? What you bring, you will eat. Uh, and so uh, you can stick around and have that if you say, no, I gotta go back to my air conditioning. I've got to retreat uh, to my abode. Uh, then you're welcome to do that, but we will have that. Uh, and we will get some fresh watermelon, cut it up in sanitary conditions, put it in <laughs> individual containers uh, and make that available so that everybody can have some fresh watermelon and celebrate the coming uh, of summer and uh, the less cutting of grass and all that good stuff uh, as the sun bleaches it out like crazy. <laughs> uh, my grass was growing like crazy and now it's saying, nah, not so much. Uh, and so I'm kind of glad for that. But uh, looking forward to all that God is going to do amongst us. And so it's short sleeve Sunday. Don't expect to see me in a full uh, suit and tie, okay? Uh, I do not like to have to dry clean these things and I will sweat like crazy uh, in 93 degree heat. Uh, so we'll be outside, we'll be enjoying that. Bathrooms will be available so you won't be uh, segregated from the bathrooms. Uh, we'll make those available and then afterwards we'll go in the back and have uh, some tables set up there. We'll bring the chairs from up front back there uh, and have some picnicking and social distanced fun together. All right. So uh, we'll do as much as we can do. How many of you know if we have the opportunity to do it, let's do as much as we have the opportunity to do uh, until uh, we get more opportunities. I don't want to call them freedoms, but anyways, uh, that was what was going through my head. All right. Let's take our uh, songbook once again. We're going to sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. We can get our eyes on all kinds of things, uh, but we've got to turn our eyes upon Jesus. You can remain seated as we sing this one, 261, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
chapter 11. John chapter 11, once you find your place, if you're physically able to stand, we're going to stand and read God's word this morning. We're going to begin in verse 28, and of course, uh, as we said, uh, this message, broken over three uh, different sermons, this passage, uh, we are now in the third of those three uh, about the raising of Lazarus. And uh, Lazarus really was along for the ride, if you will, on this. This wasn't about Lazarus. Uh, matter of fact, Lazarus was doing good, uh, and then he got called back to this earth. Uh, we'll talk about that. That may not have been the most positive thing for him, uh, coming out of the grave like, oh man, I'm back. Uh, I was doing good. What am I doing back here? Uh, and yet, uh, this was not about Lazarus. This was about all of those uh, who are present to see what was going on. Uh, and to see who Jesus really was and, and the power that he had. And my message this morning is entitled Belief, uh, because that's what this was all about, about those who are present truly believing in Jesus, truly understanding who he was and putting their entire faith uh, in who God said he was, who Jesus said he was, and who in truly indeed uh, he was. And that's our point this morning is that you would truly believe fully in Jesus. You say, well, I've believed in him uh, for salvation. Yes, but he's uh, powerful enough not only to save you, but he's powerful enough to keep you, uh, powerful enough to raise you uh, for eternal life. And I want you to see that this morning and put your full heart and trust in him, uh, whether it be for your salvation or whether it be just for your circumstances that you're uh, frustrated or fearful about. Uh, and this morning, we're going to read in John chapter 11, beginning verse 28, and we'll read down to verse 48. And when she had said so, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The master is come and calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, she goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister that of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for it hath been four days. And Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he, had thus, when th he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin, bound about with a napkin. And Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? 
For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him. The Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, as we learn from your word, as we hear what you have to say today. Lord, there are some, Lord, that struggle to believe what it is you have said about yourself. Lord, I pray that not only we would believe that you were sent to this world to die for sinners, but that you have the power over sin and death. Lord, I pray that you bless the reading of your word to our hearts. Bless this special now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. life in essence because Lazarus was a believer and he had eternal life matter of fact Lazarus would die again and so uh, this would not be a permanent fix for Lazarus uh, he would not be able to come back uh, from the fountain of youth and say I found the cure uh, there will be no more death but rather uh, he would just have his life extended uh, for a period he would have more time uh, to live matter of fact he would uh, get to get older. How many of you say that is not necessarily uh, come with a lot of health perks uh, and he would get to live older than he was and he was probably uh, middle-aged at the time uh, and had gone to uh, see his maker and now had been invited uh, to come back. And so uh, again, Lazarus was in the uh, midst of this and yet this was about 
a people believing. The word believe is an interesting word, especially uh, as used in the New Testament, specifically uh, one that is repeated in the book of John. The word believe is a key word uh, used over and over and over in the book uh, of John, and it is a word uh, that comes from a conscious choice, a conscious choice to think something to be true, to be persuaded of it, to have full confidence in it. A conscious choice. You say, why is it a conscious choice? Isn't believing just a byproduct of overwhelming evidence that forces you to believe? Well, the real question is, how do you interpret the evidence? Because having evidence for some is proof, and for others it is only probability, and for others, it's quite the opposite. It is skepticism and how did we get that evidence and is, has it been preserved? And uh, for those who are skeptical of who Jesus Christ is, it's, uh, well, you have to understand after his death, the uh, apostles, those disciples, they embellished uh, Jesus' life and they embellished his miracles. And others say, uh, well, the record that we have, the Bible that has come down uh, through the centuries is full of errors as people uh, copied it and it's got so many errors, people added things in, filled in blanks, and uh, so there is a, a matter of uh, skepticism about even the record and what's said about Jesus Christ, and others just say it's fanciful stories from the beginning. And yet others look at it and say this is the truth. This is the evidence that we have. The truth of who Jesus Christ is. Well, I discussed it on Wednesday evening about uh, the, uh, the pivotal event of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And although some would disregard uh, the Word of God and hang their faith on that, can I tell you, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is pivotal to the Christian faith. It is pivotal because this was a resurrection that happened and was witnessed. I want you to take your Bible for just a moment before we get into the meat of the sermon and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15 verse 3. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, according to the way it was prophesied, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, as it was prophesied, and that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve. And after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep. You have to understand the writing of this book is 30 to 40 years later. He said they're still alive, they're still talking about it. The witnesses of resurrection. It would have been easy to overthrow this idea of resurrection, except there were so many witnesses of it. And this day, the people standing before him would know indeed that Lazarus was dead. He had been in the grave four days. This was known to be the time uh, in which he would decompose. Matter of fact, Martha is aware of it. And she says to him, one of the funniest statements in the Bible for children to hear, by now he stinketh. You say, why do you think that's so funny? Because when I was a kid, I got in a lot of trouble in family devotions because I got cracked up at that phrase uh, and I was sent to sit in the corner where I couldn't see my brother, and I could hear him giggle, and that would make me giggle. And this was the phrase, the culprit, by now he stinketh. Now when it comes down to this matter of him being dead, all those that were around knew that he was dead. They comforted his death. They knew it was a bad idea to open the tomb, that he indeed, uh, medically for that day, he would have been de pronounced deceased, for sure. And yet they're going to witness resurrection. And as they witness resurrection, it is overwhelming proof that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was. This overwhelming proof for some would cause them to leave. And others would walk away and talk to the Pharisees and say, you've got to do something about this guy because people are believing 
You better watch out. You might lose your position. You see, there were those who interpreted the same information and yet did not choose to accept it as a means of belief. I want you to see, first of all, this morning, the waiting of Jesus. There's some uh, parts of this message that are really about what Jesus has for you today. And I want you to glean out of that uh, as you see what he, how he interacted with uh, Mary. The Bible says in verse 28, And when she had so said, she went her way, talking of Martha. She had just said uh, to Jesus Christ that you are the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. And she turns and pivots and goes to find Mary. And the Bible says here that she called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Jesus wanted to speak to Mary. Can I tell you, Jesus wants to speak to you today. Uh, that he wants a personal audience with you. Uh, we sit in a big room like this and we hear the preacher preach, but can I tell you, Jesus wants to speak to you individually. He has the intention that some part of this message is exactly for you. Some part of this message is for something that's going on in your life and you really could put your name in there, uh, that he is looking for you. The master has come, and he calls for you. He wants to speak to you. He doesn't want uh, this to seem like a general message. Matter of fact, each and every day, Jesus seeks personal audience with each person. He wants to spend time with you every day. I wonder, do you leave him hanging? Do you leave him hanging? Think of this. What if she said, hey, psst. Now, she's discreet. This is a new one for Martha, being discreet, okay? Uh, just meeting with Jesus, just changed her whole outlook. And she comes in and she says, Mary, what, what? Mary, come here for a second. Hey, Jesus has come. Well, Mary already knew this. Matter of fact, when they announced it, the Bible says uh, that Mary stayed still in the house. She knew Jesus had come. Uh, she knew he was around. She knew he was on his way. And Martha ran out to see him, but Mary sat in the house just waiting. And now Martha says, hey, he wants to talk to you. I find this interesting because there's two mourning sisters here, and Jesus speaks to each of them individually. You know what that tells me? He cares about us individually. He cares about us personally. He knows what you're going through. He didn't say, well, if, if Mary doesn't want to come, then let her suffer. No, he said, hey, go tell Mary I want to talk to her. Go call for her, and I will wait for her out here. He didn't come in. Once he knew he was in town, the throngs would come, uh, the people would come. He sat down and waited. Whoo, man, the Almighty sitting and waiting for Mary. Hey, if he'll wait for Mary, he'll wait for you. Can you imagine if she sat in the house saying, well, I'm not going. I'm too sad. And Jesus just waited. Maybe watched the sundial. I don't know what they had those days. I wonder if she's coming. Is she going to come or not? I guess not. Don't make the Lord wait for you. Uh, someone said, you know what? I, I, I've just struggled in my uh, spiritual life. Can I tell you, he's never missed his appointment with you, even if you've missed it with him. He's waiting for you. Just sitting and waiting, like he was for the woman at the well. Just sitting and waiting for her to come along. What a wonderful thing to know that he cares this much. Jesus wanted to speak for, to Mary, and now he was going to wait for Mary. Verse 30, now when Jesus was not yet coming to town, but was in the place where Martha met him, the Jews then that were with her in the house and comforted her, and we already talked about this, this was a scene uh, of a funeral, this was a scene of a loss and getting over the loss of somebody uh, who was beloved to them, and it says that when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, she goeth unto the grave to weep there. Oh, four days later, and she's just overcome with emotion. She's got a head raise, an interesting thing for believers. Aren't they an interesting place? Because you go to the grave knowing the person's not there. It's just the remains of who they are, and yet uh, sometimes when you want to weep, you want to go to the place that is the only tangible uh, remains of, of who they were, and so you go down there and you shed some tears over a tombstone, or uh, you go to a place of a grave, but knowing they're not there. They said, she's off to the grave, and so they decided to go and follow her. It's interesting what we see happens. 
Verse 32, and when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet. You know, she was often at the feet of Jesus. This is an interesting statement about Mary because Mary is often at the feet of Jesus. I, I love this. One, one year, uh, our whole theme for a church was uh, at Jesus' feet because I just love uh, the fact that at the feet of Jesus, you're right where you need to be. You're right where you need to be. The feet of Jesus, how beautiful this is. She fell at Jesus' feet. We see in Matthew 15.30 that his feet is a place of healing. Matthew 15.30, it says that great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. If you're sick, if you are lame, uh, if you are chronically ill, and you look up, because somebody's placed you at the feet of Jesus, that's a great place to be. You see, they were bringing those people to Jesus' feet. Maybe you have someone in your life, someone in your family, that needs a healing touch from Jesus Christ. Maybe it's physical healing that they need. Or maybe it's spiritual healing. Can I tell you, there's no better place to cast them than at the feet of Jesus. Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Putting him at the feet of Jesus. I'm sure people who had never met Jesus and never seen Jesus looked up into his face uh, from his feet and got healing. I encourage us to spend time at Jesus' feet because it's a place of healing. It's a place of hearing. You're aware of this in Luke 10, verse 39, that uh, she had a sister, speaking of Martha, called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. You know, there's no better place to sit than to hear at the feet of Jesus. This is an interesting term uh, that means to sit as a learner. Paul said, I learned at the feet of Gamaliel. Uh, it meant to sit down on the floor uh, and have your ears uh, and your mind wide open so that you could absorb what it was they were going to teach you. And this was how Mary was. Is your heart open to learning from the Lord? Uh, I encourage you to have uh, that heart that says, I just want to hear from God today. A place of hearing is a place of hoping. This one's an amazing one. John chapter 12, one chapter later, we're going to see Mary at the feet of Jesus once again. This is after Lazarus has been raised again. But it's referenced in John chapter 11. Look at John chapter 11, verse 2. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. You have to understand, all of this is recorded after it's done, okay? Uh, so he's not writing it down as we go. John is uh, writing from a later date and writing all this down. And the Bible encapsulates in this verse that the reputation Mary had after the events were over with was she was the Mary. Are you with me? She was the Mary. This is her reputation. You know that guy. That's the guy that, uh, you know climbed the flagpole and got the kitten down, that guy. Oh, yeah, 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 I know that guy, I know that guy. That guy, you remember the one? He was the guy that hit that home run in that game, and, oh, do you remember? Oh, I was there, I remember that. Something that just strikes you about that person, it becomes their reputation. You know what Mary's reputation was? She was the one that came in with ointment and used her hair to wipe the feet of Jesus. Now recognizing they used towels to anoint someone's feet uh, and wipe, but she used her own hair, and the Bible says the ointment filled the room, and people said, you remember, oh Mary, Mary, which Mary? A lot of Marys. You know, the one that wiped Jesus' feet with her hair, anointed him, that Mary. It's an interesting statement here because now we know that she is at his feet and they're complaining again. Every time this happens, they complain. Oh, the cost of the ointment. Oh, the cost of the ointment. I think sometimes they're a little bit jealous that people would lavish things on Jesus Christ. That they would give him the finest robe that man had to offer. That they would pour out a year's worth of wages just to pour ointment on him. And Jesus said, now hold on a second. She is anointing me 
toward my coming death. You say, that may seem a little bit morbid, but you have to understand that she didn't know all that was going to happen. Jesus was saying, this is how I have received this as an ointment toward my coming death. Uh, but Mary is lavishing and putting her heart out, saying, all my hope is in you. Everything I have is placed in you. It's a very close relationship that she had sitting at his feet. And once again, the Bible records that she runs up and she falls at his feet. Now what is she saying at his feet? Did you know what she's about to say is verbatim to what Martha said? Martha and Mary, word for word, say the same thing. Coincidence? I think not. When two people in the family repeat the same words, what do you get out of that event? What do you get from that? That they've been talking. How many of you know families talk? You can raise your hand if you're in the house, all right? How many of you know families talk? How many of you know that after talks, oftentimes families share an opinion? It's an opinion strongly held throughout the family. Now, families disagree. I'm not saying families don't disagree and that there's a divide, you know, dad and all of his cronies and mom and all of her cronies uh, all on a particular uh, situation. But oftentimes, through hashing it out and talking it, they come to a conclusion about something that has happened and it is a strongly held uh, opinion in the family. Here is their strongly held opinion uh, in the family in verse 32. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Lord, if you were here, then Lazarus would still be alive. Now, while this had become a repeated statement and a strongly held opinion, it was not rooted in true faith. You see, they had to believe that the reason Lazarus was not healed was not because Jesus wasn't near enough to heal him. Well, if you'd have been here, I could heal him from anywhere. Why would I have to be here? Uh, number two, that uh, the reason that he was not healed uh, was because somehow Jesus was not concerned about him. We're going to find out Jesus was very concerned for Lazarus. So somehow Jesus' proximity or his lack of concern, these prevented him. But had you been here, maybe a little bit if you had come when we'd asked, if you just showed up on time, he'd still be alive. You see, that's not rooted in true faith. Yes, it's faith that he could have healed them from sickness, but it was not faith that he was the God and creator of all life uh, who could raise him back to life if that be uh, his plan or possibly that was not his plan. And sometimes we pray over loved ones and we pray that they'd be healed and we pray that they would survive their illness and we uh, pray that they won't be taken away and we just haven't trusted God to say that may not be his plan. And if I truly believe in him, that I know he's not only the servant who walks among us, but he is the sovereign over all events. And if it is not his plan for that to take place, then we can have faith and trust that his plan is good. Matter of fact, if they could see Lazarus right now, they may not be so concerned that him come back to where they're at, but maybe that they would want to take a trip to where he's at. Are you with me this morning? Are you awake? Are you asleep? Uh, I'm telling you, like, where he's at. Now, we understand he's in uh, Abraham's bosom. We have a description uh, of that particular location. And please don't ask me to tell you uh, whether the rich man in hell was during this brief interlude uh, when Lazarus came and then came back again, or if it was later after he died. Please, please don't ask me for that information uh, because I've yet to ascertain that. Uh, hopefully, one day I will, but I don't know. Uh, but... Here we know that he is in Abraham's bosom. It's a place of entire security, safety, uh, and free from all harm, free from all anguish and pain. And the only thing that is left is for Jesus to rise again from the dead uh, and take those saints right into the presence of God. I don't think he was saying, can I get back 
Anybody got a ticket to the ferry that goes back over Jordan, uh, gets back over to the other side? I was just hoping to see my sisters one more time. I think he's saying, come on over, come on, it's good over here. Hey, your loved ones in heaven are not saying, I wish I could get a trip back. They're saying, no, no, come, come join me over here. Please come uh, to where I am at. Reminds me of the guy who was uh, uh, stranded on an island and, and uh, uh, with two other guys and a, a little lamp floated up. Now, believe you me, I don't believe in genies or lamps, okay? It's, an, it's a humorous story. <laughs> That's all it is. Lamp floats up and they try to decide who gets to rub the lamp and they said, hey, let's make a compromise. Maybe the genie will work with all three of us. And so, okay, that's a good idea. Uh, we're stranded here and so they rub the lamp and present to the genie, hey, we each want one wish. We know you get three wishes, traditionally, historically, all right? Uh, and so we each want one wish. How would that uh, be? Okay, okay, that's fine. We'll do it that way, all right? First guy says, hey, I miss my family. I wish I could be with them and boy, he just poof, and he's gone right there with his family. The second guy says, boy, I wish miss work. Anybody say that? Okay. I miss work. I miss the people I work with. I wish I was back at work, and poof, boy, he was right back at work, no longer on the stranded island. Third guy's sitting there, and he said, boy, I miss my friends, these two buddies. I wish they were back. <laughs> now, nobody is wishing to come back from heaven to join us again. No how, matter how much we wish that they were back here, they're doing better. We should say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and reunite, reunite us all. Or, Lord, if I'm faced with the grave, uh, that's not a bad problem. That's a portal to heaven. And so she says, hey, I wish you'd have been here. I, I think maybe he would say, I wish you could see how Lazarus is doing. But really, I think what he is wanting to say is I wish you had the faith that I could raise him again. I just wish you'd believe. Believe not in a version of me, but in who I truly am. That truly, if I desired, I could raise him again from the dead. And this is what he's already declared to his disciples. Let's go and get him up from sleep. Let's go and put an alarm clock on death. And wake him up and shake him up and get him out of there. And yet the people there were in despair. I want you to see the weeping of Jesus. The weeping of Jesus. I have on many occasions studied this passage because the prevailing question is why did Jesus weep? What was the reason for his tears? I think you've asked that question before. Why did Jesus weep? <laughs> Okay? Besides the children in children's church who are trying to memorize the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept so they could get uh, a cookie or a star on their chart, uh, there is great significance in this passage because, particularly, it pauses for a moment and says, Jesus wept, and doesn't exactly explain, doesn't say Jesus wept because, but it just says Jesus wept. And so I've studied this passage, and I want to give you Three reasons that I believe Jesus wept, all, I believe, plausible reasons. And I want you to know that in study of this passage, it doesn't turn out the way possibly I thought it would have. But I want you to see what the Bible says. The Bible says, there, when Jesus, verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. I looked up these words, groaned and troubled. What did he groan over? I thought the word groan would probably mean he was caught up in their despair and groaned with them because we have the word groan used in Romans chapter 8 that we groan uh, with things that we cannot utter, uh, the things that we cannot verbalize, and so we groan as so off also does uh, all of creation. But this groan particularly has the idea of frustration. Frustration. The word troubled means to be agitated, to be stirred up, to be bothered. And it's interesting that this phrase will be repeated again, where it says again that he groans in the Spirit. Verse 38, then Jesus therefore again, groaning in himself, came to the grave. 
This idea of groaning, of uh, being bothered or frustrated. I see that Jesus wept, first of all, because of their lack. Because of their lack. He planned to raise Lazarus from the dead, but the people nearest to him still did not believe in who he truly was. Had he raised someone from the dead already? Absolutely. He had done this on more than one occasion. And yet they are focused on the fact that Lazarus died and that's final. And if he had come earlier, uh, then Jesus would have been able to save him. But he can't save him now. Hey, by the way, Abraham had more faith than that. The Bible says when God told him, hey, sacrifice your son Isaac, Hebrews explains later and says that he believed that he could raise him up again from the dead. He said, I don't know how God's going to work this out because I put my son on the altar and, and I'm going I'm to slay my son just as God has asked me to do. And I don't know, but I just believe that if he is the promised heir, he is the promised son, then God is able also to raise him up from the dead. I just believe I think it to be true. I am fully persuaded, and I put my confidence in it. I believe. They didn't. All the people around. Jesus is coming. Well, that would have worked a few days ago. It's not going to do us any good now. And Jesus groans. Have you ever groaned? You ever groaned when somebody underestimated? what you are able to do? Groan when your wife said, can you fix the dishwasher? <sighs> of course. Why underestimate me? Have you ever grown that way? I was just wondering if you could make just a little end table for me. I know you've got $50,000 worth of shop tools out there. I just wonder if you could put piece together a little end table and you groan. Have you ever grown that way? You hurt me. You hurt me by underestimating what it is I'm capable of doing. Now recognize their underestimation is infinitely far because he is the Almighty. Robed in flesh, the great I Am, who's walking amongst them. He wept because of their lack. Secondly, he wept because of their loss. There's definitely an element here that he was infirmities. He sees their weeping. By the way, the word weep here for their weeping is utter despair. The word that rendered Jesus wept does not mean despair. It does not be in the gloom of loss of hope. It means to burst forth with emotion, to be overcome of emotion and burst out crying. Anybody ever have that happen to them? You weren't planning on crying? You didn't want to cry. I didn't want to cry. I was going to try to do this without crying. But the emotion came upon you. You know what that tells me? That Jesus was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He wasn't crying because of despair. He's going to shake hands with Lazarus here in just a few minutes. He's not crying because of the loss of Lazarus. Oh, I've lost him. But he was crying because of their loss. You see... How they felt touched his heart. By the way, the Bible lets us know throughout that God is touched by how we feel. God doesn't sit up in heaven and say, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? How are we going to make it through this COVID? I don't know how I'm going to pay all the bills. He doesn't worry about all that. The only way, the only way he is touched by that is feeling our infirmity feeling our difficulty and he is in touch and he is touched lamentation 3 verse 51 mine eye affecteth mine heart as god sees how it troubles us so it troubles him now he can solve it but he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities he wept because of their lack he wept because of their loss but he wept because of his love because of his love. Something about the way he cried made all the people around him say, wow, he must have really loved Lazarus. Now we don't know that was a misinterpretation of his tears, but it's recorded for us in scripture, so I'm going to take it as if God wanted us to know this was one of the reasons for his tears. 
And he cries as they come to the grave. And people say, boy, he loved Lazarus. Can you imagine that God loves us enough that our tears make a difference to him? Psalm 56 and verse 8, it says, Thou tellest my wanderings, thou puttest my, thou, put thou my tears into thy bottle, are they not in thy book? So our tears fall, and God says, okay, put a tear in their bottle, and write down in the book. They cried because uh, they lost a friend to disloyalty. Let me say that's some serious organization. They're kept in the bottle, and then they're written down in his book. Every time you cry, heaven moves to say, here, here's why they cried. What an amazing thing that God cares so much that he is concerned about our tears. Isaiah 53 says that Jesus would be a man of sorrows and would be acquainted with grief. Uh, he would be one that would feel the grief uh, of others. He was not feeling the loss of Lazarus uh, because Lazarus would be coming out of the grave in moments. He was feeling the loss of the people around him. And because of his love, oh, how he loved Lazarus. Oh, how he loved Martha. Oh, how he loved Mary. Oh, how he loved all of those who are feeling loss. And can I tell you, if you're feeling loss, he loves you too. And your tears are kept careful track of in the presence of the Lord. The weeping of Jesus. Then finally, the wonder of Jesus. Jesus is about to step out on a stage that no one else can fill. He's about to step out and show that he is absolutely, extraordinarily, unbelievably amazing in a way that nobody else is. He's going to do something that is going to shake everybody uh, who is standing there. And I have proof that they were visibly and physically disturbed at the sight of Lazarus raising again. I want you to see uh, the power of his wonder. And, and we're going to begin there uh, in verse 37. The Bible says, And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? You know, they're asking the wrong question. You see, they are more concerned about preventing death than having power over death. This seems to be the focus of COVID. You know what the answer for COVID is? Vaccinations! Prevent death! No, the answer for COVID is trust Jesus because you're going to die sometime or another from COVID or something else. And the only real answer is being prepared for death. And then if we truly have our faith in Christ, we're not worried about death prevention because we have power over death in Jesus Christ. This ought to be our true concern. Is our faith firmly uh, in Jesus Christ? And the Bible once again says, that Jesus groaned at their lack of understanding. And he groaned again as he walked to the grave. <laughs> Couldn't he have prevented him from dying? Yes, but that's not the plan. And he was troubled. Look in verse 39. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, uh, by this time he stinketh, uh, for he hath been dead four days. And Jesus said unto her, I said I not unto thee, if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. He said, if you believe, didn't I say something amazing was going to happen? Well, take the stone away. <laughs> Get it out of the way. Do I have to do everything around here? <laughs> have you ever said that, Mom? Do I have to do everything around here? Just move the stone, <laughs> okay? I'll let you do the light lifting and I'll take care of raising the dead. Move the stone out of the way. You know, it takes belief to move a stone, doesn't it? It took them believing that Jesus was truly going to do what he said. He was doing. I, I think if you had no faith, you'd say, I'm not moving the stone. He's dead, okay? He's rotting. We don't want to see him in this condition. Don't make us do this. But they started wheeling that stone away. Hey, there's some faith. Okay, Jesus, you told us to move the stone. He told Peter to cast the nets. Well, Peter cast one net. He at least got started. Of course, he paid the price because all the fish that were going to be in several nets all got in one net, uh, and then he had trouble. So he said, roll the stone away. 
All right? Here comes the proof of who Jesus Christ is. Verse 41, And then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee, for thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. What an interesting statement. I just want everybody to hear that this was your plan, and that truly I am the Son of God that thou hast sent. Verse 43, And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! When he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin, and Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. This is the proof that they were dumbfounded. Because he's making his way out like this. Jesus said, hey guys, let him go. <laughs> Unwrap him. I think they're all standing there. <laughs> I'm awake. <sighs> and they're like, what? He said, guys, 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 hey, shh, 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 hey, hey, let him go. I wonder if he's over there. <laughs> Which to be interpreted is, how long are you going to let me stand here? Hey, by the way, if the dead stand up and walk out of the grave, it's not the zombie apocalypse, okay? It's the power of resurrection. And here he's standing before them, and their minds are exploding with the information that is being presented to them. They don't quite get it. But now they're saying, okay, okay. I can see that it was the plan all along. Jesus allowed him to die because, wow, what we were going to see today. And they started spreading the word of resurrection power at the hand of Jesus. No, no other explanation. He's been in there four days. He's decomposing. They know that. And Jesus calls his specific name. And when he calls his name specifically, he comes out. He's wrapped in grave clothes and they let him free. Uh, and he's, hey, okay. And I just don't know what other else to do but to believe in Jesus Christ. Boy, they believed. Matter of fact, they believed so much that when it was reported to the Pharisees, the ruling Jewish class, they said, what are we going to do for this man doeth so many miracles? If we leave him alone, all men will believe on him. Now you have to understand, when somebody who is your friend compliments you, you can take that with a grain of salt. But when somebody who is your sworn enemy says if he keeps going the way he's going, he's going to win. There's no denying it. Everybody's going to believe in him. You know, that's a good time to say, well, if everybody is going to believe in him, maybe it's time for us to believe in him too. How unfortunate it was that they were stubborn in their choice to continue in disbelief. They were stubborn in their choice. As God said to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. As the Apostle Paul, as Saul of Tarsus, is kicking back at the prodding of the Holy Spirit, saying, believe, believe, and he's kicking back, no, no, I don't want to believe. And the more he fought against it, the angrier he got. You know, the more the Pharisees and the high priests fought against the truth of Jesus Christ, the angrier they got. The more they wanted to kill him. The more they wanted to get rid of him. I wish they would have just believed. As far as we know, we don't have any evidence that the high priest in Jerusalem ever put his faith in Christ, nor his successor. A few possibly of the Sanhedrin, but many of them stepped off into eternity, although they were presented with the resurrection of Christ. They never believed. Oh, I would encourage you, be amongst those that said, hey, the proof is overwhelming. He rose again from the dead. He was seen. 
of many thousands of people, the testimony and record still resounds this day. And this book being copied more times than any other book down through the centuries, still to this day, the best-selling English book uh, in, in, printed in English is this King James Bible is a record uh, showing that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. It's been supernaturally preserved that we might have the evidence even yet today. The Apostle Paul, after his conversion, said this, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He didn't say, I, I believed without understanding. He said, I know. I know the person I believed in. I know what he's capable of. And my belief is a conscious choice. You say, well, I don't believe in anything. That's a choice. That's a choice. You choose to believe or you choose not to believe. It's a choice. Choices have consequences. Daniel Webster Whittle. How many of you ever heard of Daniel Webster Whittle? D.W. Whittle. Anybody? Okay. I'm not seeing any responses. Also known by his friends as Major Whittle. Major Whittle served in the Civil War. Matter of fact, he spent a good time in Georgia marching through. I won't go any further. I live in the South. I know where I'm at. After the war, he became personal friends with D.L. Moody. One of his war stories actually inspired Philip P. Bliss uh, to write the song, Hold the Fort, for I am coming. He became so close with D.L. Moody that his daughter married into the Moody family and bore that last name. He's known for writing the song, Showers of Blessings. How many of you love that song? Showers of Blessings. Mercy drops around us are falling, but for the showers we plead. He also wrote the song, Moment by Moment, another favorite song. But his best known hymn is entitled, I Know Whom I Have Believed. And he wrote this, I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he has made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in Him. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me, of weary days or golden, weary ways or golden days before His face I see. I know not when my Lord may come, at night or noonday fair, or if I'll walk the veil with Him, or meet Him in the air. But... I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able.